and I know it's hard for those in the back to hear. So I'll try to use my teacher's voice. Can you guys hear way back there or not? Can you hear okay? Yes, you can hear. So Lisa, you're gonna to have to talk loud too. This looks like we're using a mic up here, but this is only the mic that works for the Zoom. Sorry, we don't have a mic for in this room right now. So um, we'll just all talk really loud. <laughs> so I get to introduce Lisa tonight and her wonderful world of moths. Uh, Lisa is a friend. She is a Defenders member. She is a mentor for WPPC. She is the president of McHenry County Audubon. Uh, well, gosh, there's so much, I'm sure I'm leaving things. Oh, she's a trustee for Holiday Hills um, and she works full time. And yet she has found time in her life to become one of the top, I'm gonna to say top four birders in our county. And she has <laughs> top three, top four, top, anyway, top four birders in the county. <laughs> anyway, and she has uh, now taken on, not only has she taught herself all about these birds, uh, but she's also uh, taught herself about creating a, a haven in her backyard for birds and for pollinators like moths. So once she's gotten this idea in her head that she wants to learn more about a subject such as moths, she attacks it full force. So she is becoming an expert now on moths. So you can tell by the pictures we're going to see is something about the beauty of moths. We're going to learn a little bit about IDing them, and um, we're going to learn about their importance in our ecosystem. So Lisa, take it away. Thank you, Nancy. All right, I'm going to try to find a, a good spot to stand, as well as, all right, can you hear me in the back? Do I need to talk louder? Good? All right, cool. Can I clip this on me? Yeah. All right. Well, it's great to see everybody tonight, and I'm, I'm, it's great to see so much interest in moths. That's fantastic. Um, I feel like, you know, butterflies sometimes get all the attention, but really, it's about the moths. And you're going to find out why tonight. So my name is Lisa Meyer. Thank you, Nancy, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I will not talk about myself anymore and all the crazy stuff I do and how I have no time to do any of it, let alone sleep. Uh, but anyway, we're going to get into moths and um, yeah, Nancy already said we're going to talk a little bit ID. We're going to talk a little bit about um, why moths are important and how you can attract them to your yard as well. Let me see. There we go. Okay. So just to give you an idea, um, just how many moths there are in the world. Butterflies are nothing compared to the amount of moths <laughs> there are. I mean, what do I have here? I forget. Eh, I think Illinois has maybe. 40 butterflies, something like that. If you don't include the skippers, maybe. Um, but there are, you know, hundreds, thousands of moths. Um, so just like worldwide, there's an estimate 300 species of moths, only about, you know, 14, 15,000 butterflies. So just that ratio of just how many moths there are to butterflies. Um, it's, it's incredibly huge, um, the diversity of moths. And moths are pretty much everywhere. Um, obviously, I think we've all probably seen them in our pantries, in our, uh, in our grain. Um, I get them in my cat litter. I was, it took me forever to figure out where they were coming from, but it's a wheat-based cat litter. And I figured out, I'm like, oh, this is a, a grain moth. And there it is. Okay, that's where it's coming from. Um, so just, just some you know, numbers, just to give you an idea. Um, in North America alone, there's only 750 butterflies versus, you know, 12,000 moths. Um, and again, this is estimates because we don't actually know how many moths there are. I'm sure there are, especially if you go down to like Central America, South America, uh, there's probably a lot of species that have yet to be discovered. Um, just for families of moths, there's 40 families of moths versus five of butterflies. So again, and that's, that's because, as we'll touch on, Briefly here, uh, butterflies actually evolved from moths, just like bees evolved from wasps. Sort of the same sort of thing going on there. Um, so as you can see, moths evolved you know, 250 million years ago, about 100 million years ago, butterflies. So moths have been around for a long time. I had to squeeze it in there. It's not the greatest picture, but that's the family tree of uh, uh, Lip Lipidotra. I'm probably saying that wrong. Randy. Oh, I'm, I'm terrible at Latin, so I, I usually don't say. Um, so if you look at this chart, this is all the Lipidotra. So that's all the butterflies and moths. Only this little portion here 
is your butterflies. So again, ponds, moths, a little bit of butterflies. Did somebody call my name? No? Oh, okay. Uh, so. All right. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad everybody gets it. Right. Everybody gets it. Good. <laughs> All right. So what what actually makes it a moth? And this is a this is where things get confusing, um, especially when you're trying to identify what kind of moth it is. It gets super complicated, not just because of how many you're trying to filter through to get to the one you want. But unlike birds, I'm a big birder in case nobody knows. Um, but like birds, you have, you know, a family, like the thrushes, they all look like thrushes, right? A robin looks like a bluebird, looks like a hermit thrush. They may have different colors or patterns or whatever, but the shape, the size, their behavior, it's all pretty similar. When you get to moths, throw that out the window. You can have a family of moths and they all look different. They have maybe different host plants. They behave differently. Some might be nocturnal, some might be more diurnal in the daytime. So it, it's, it really gets confusing. It's really hard to identify um, uh, down to the species. But often if you look up, you know, on Google or whatever, you'll see a chart or some some graph or some meme like thing like this that's like, oh, this is a moth and this is a butterfly. You know, moth have, you know, antenna that are fuzzy um, versus a butterfly that has antenna that are long and skinny, and, you know, clubbed at the end. You know, moths are dull and boring. Butterflies are beautiful and pretty. Uh, you know, sort of these, you know, these kind of arbitrary, very overly simplified um, things. And we're gonna go through each kind of one of these and sort of uh, debunk them, if, if, if you will. Then you got some really complicated ones. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm going, I'm hitting too many buttons. There we go. So this is actually called the butterfly moth. <laughs> this is found in Central America. I actually took this picture in Panama. And it is a moth, but it does look like a butterfly. It defies all those characteristics. It even has clubbed antenna like a butterfly. Um, so very confusing. But that just shows how closely related they are on the evolutionary scale. They are, I mean, they are incredibly similar. They're pretty much the same thing when you really get down to it. Um, so Keep that in mind when we're when we're going through stuff. It is it is not easy to tell them apart. Let's just start at the beginning. Active at night. Moths are only active at night, right? Wrong. Very wrong. Many moths are active during the day. Um, this family of moth, the not today, not today. Randy can help me with some of those. You're you're all not gonna know what I'm saying anyway, so don't matter. <laughs> But the looper moths are really a, a good daytime flying one. If you have, you know, a garden with a lot of flowers, you can often see these guys flitting around. Um, they tend to, you know, beat their wings quite a bit. So you, it's hard to tell maybe what kind they are, but the loopers are definitely a good one um, to, to see. But this is one group of family that's usually active during the day. These guys, I call them the three blacks. Um, these are all day active moths. These are all able to see in our area. Most of these you'll be able to see in your area. Pretty much all these pictures, unless I tell you it's from Central or South America or something, are all from this area, Chicago region. Um, so these three, they're all very similar looking, but all daytime flying moths. Um, the least common would be probably the grape leaf skeletonizer moth. Moths have really cool names, by the way, like that one. <laughs> The yellow collared skate moss really common. So is the, oh God, I can never say this one. How do you say this one, Randy? Canuchin, the Virginia Canuchin. Yeah, get, the, get that pronunciation out of that word. But those are all three you can see ah, coming up pretty soon. The boars, if you have a garden, we don't like these guys typically because they cause problems, uh, but they are very pretty. They're very cool looking, a lot of them. Uh, here's just a few examples. You can see that the raspberry crown borer looks a lot like kind of like a wasp or something. It's got some of that mimicking properties to it. Clear wings. It doesn't doesn't look like a moth, right? It looks more like a bee or something like that. Even this guy kind of looks more like a beetle to me. The squash vine borer. 
my husband gets mad whenever he sees those because he loves his squash and oh man when those I see start seeing those guys flying around he's like kill it I'm like I don't want to kill it <laughs> These are probably a lot of people's favorites, the clear wings, right? We all love the hummingbird clear wing and the snowberry clear wing, both beautiful, you know, moths that look like hummingbirds and day flying. Um, they really love Minarda, if you have Minarda. Um, that's usually one that they hit a lot in my yard, but you know, they'll, they'll hit almost anything. I think this one is on catnip or some type of mint. Here's just an example of one species, the forage looper, and how different they can look. Um, sometimes they're very boldly patterned. Sometimes they're pretty dull, more brown, not as high contrast. So you can just kind of see just an example. But these guys I find a lot too. This is one when you're walking through the grass, um, you'll see it kind of fly up and then it'll kind of fly back down and kind of try to bury itself back under the grass. Um, so that's a, another common one you can see around here during the daytime. Also during the daytime, we have caterpillars that we can look for. Um, and caterpillars are a whole nother range of interesting camouflage, interesting uh, just shapes, sizes, colors. Um, I think most of us know monarch caterpillars on monarch plants. Um, here's just a few other ones. I, I was like, monarchs are, is a butterfly, but moths too have a lot of different characteristics. This is another popular milkweed one, the milkweed tussock moth. Um, you'll often see these, they kind of look like the monarch caterpillar and they're kind of meant to mimic that, um, give those strong colors as warning signs to predators to say, hey, don't eat me because I might be toxic. I may not. This guy here, the camouflage uh, looper that's on the very end there, very cool caterpillar. It's one of the few examples of insects that will actually use tools outside, something outside of itself to aid in its survival. So you can kind of tell in that picture, it's got these kind of spindly looking things coming off it, these hairs. Those are actually flower petals that it stuck to itself in order to help camouflage it. And depending on where it is, it will take flower petals from different, the flowers in its area that it's like kind of hiding in. I've, I've found them with all different stuff kind of stuck to them. So very cool that, you know, a caterpillar, an insect is using, you know, again, something outside itself in order to aid in its survival. I think most of us are familiar with the woolly bear, right? A favorite in the fall and early spring. Those guys are crazy. I mean, they have like uh, antifreeze in their blood and they just totally freeze solid and then they, you know, they reemerge. I mean, that's, that's crazy, right? It's just a caterpillar. It should die, right? But no, they 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 live on. Um, we also get the you might see another type of woolly bear, the the whiter ones, or sometimes they're really yellow. Um, both uh, tiger moths, Isabel tiger moth and Virginia tiger moth. I've seen both of those moths during the day as well. Um, this guy's very pretty. The Virginia tiger moth uh, has really cool yellow spots and stuff underneath. Hard to see though. All right. So another common misconception is that they're dull, moths are dull. I think we've already seen quite a few examples of that's not being true. It is true that some of them are, uh, and that's due to camouflage. They, you know, a lot, of, a lot of animals in general want to camouflage in the leaf litter or under leaves, um, like the bad wing there. Again, another super cool name. Um, it's green, it's one of the green moths, so it likes to, you know, lay against leaves and stuff like that to camouflage itself. You got the small bird dropping moth, which does kind of look like a pile of bird droppings. Uh, the asteroid, I just love the name of that one because doesn't that look cool? Look at the head of that thing. <laughs> just cool stuff. Um, the large maple leaf spanworm looks like a big piece of dead leaf, you know? Um, so some moths are very dull in order to camouflage themselves. However, a lot of them are not dull. Uh, the Luna moth, I think, is a lot of favorites. I've never seen a Luna moth here. They can occur here. Um, usually I've seen them up in like Wisconsin, uh, a little further north. But um, the Hepola moths, there's a couple different varieties of them. Those you can see around here. Very cool, very bold patterns. Um, I love these guys, these eight spotted foresters. And those, their one of their host plants is Virginia creeper. 
So I actually had one of these guys in my yard on my Virginia creeper. And I cannot tell you how ecstatic I was. I was like, <laughs> so again, very, you know, a lot of variety um, in color. This is a super tiny, what they call a micro moth. Um, that was a hard one to get a picture. I mean, he was tiny, tiny, but very cool. He's got these almost like his legs look like spikes almost. So not dull, those guys. Yes. Well, there's a few, like I know I got a couple from Randy, Amanda, but yeah, most of them are mine. Um, some moths look like butterflies. Um, the orange mint moth, I always love that one. That's a really pretty moth. Um, another one you could see during the day flying around. Um, chickweed geometers, those guys are pretty common too. Another day flyer, really pretty. And they, they don't look hairy. Like a lot of moths and even butterflies look kind of dull or iridescent. These guys look waxy. They're kind of weird looking, uh, but very cool. White striped babylax. I thought they were butterflies for like ever, but they're moths. Um, so you got, again, a variety that they look more like butterflies than moths. If you were to come across some of these, you would probably think they were a butterfly over a moth. Here's just a few examples from Central America. Uh, these are all from Costa Rica. Again, just a variety of colors, a variety. I love this guy. He looks like he's graffiti or something. Um, and this one, I love them all. But just some more examples. That one that looks like a wasp too. Another common misconception is that moths have wings that rest at their sides, where butterflies have wings that rest flat. Well, if you've ever seen skipper butterflies, you know they tend to carry their wings up or even, you know, kind of half mast. And again, a lot of moths will hold their wings at their sides, but a lot of them will hold them flat, or you get some that roll up, um, like this webworm here or a lot of the, the grass, the grass veneers. Um, those are the ones too, when you're walking in a field and you see them bounce up in the grass and then they hide because they roll up their wings. Um, and then they look like little tubes, um, not really like moths. The plume moths too, like this morning glory plume moth, they kind of make a T because they roll up their wings as well. So again, the whole, you know, resting the wings at the side thing, eh, not a good thing to base your idea off of. Feathered or pointed antenna. Now the antenna is probably your best bet to tell it's a moth uh, versus a butterfly. This is a butterfly here. I think that's a azure of some type. Um, but you can see it's a long antenna with the club at the end. Skippers have a bent club. They're also butterflies, the smaller butterflies. They have a club at the end, but it's bent. It's got like a little, little, little ear on the end. Um, moths can have a variety of antenna types. You can get like a combed look, you can get super fuzzy, you can get kind of something very similar to a butterfly where it's just kind of flat and long. Um, so again, a variety of antenna, but if you definitely see that clubbed look, that long, thin, segmented club, that's a butterfly. Almost anything else could be a moth. Thick body. Again, not always true. Yes, moths can have really fat, thick, fuzzy bodies, but they can also be really skinny. They can also be um, not fuzzy, uh, like the plume moth again. That's another, again, weird one. Doesn't look like a moth. Butterflies, I think also, a lot of them can be real fat looking, like that tiger swallowtail right there is a real fat body. So I'm not sure where that thin, thick body thing came from, but but obviously you look at the maple sandworm up there. He's pretty, he's pretty chubby. Yeah. He'd be a good meal for a bat or a, you know, a, a night hawk or something. So why should we care about moths? One, they are extremely important to the food web. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that. Uh, but moths really are, especially for things like birds, are huge. Um, you know, most birds feed their babies caterpillars, and most of those caterpillars are come from the moth family. Um, right now, it's spring migration. The trees are just starting to open up and bud up, so we're getting a lot of those budworm caterpillars coming out. Migrating birds love those. And if you're looking for warblers or tanagers or vireos, flycatchers, a lot of those types of birds, 
they're going after those caterpillars right now. Um, on one of our recent walks I just watched, we had a blue gray gnat catcher catch this big old caterpillar and he's just beating it against the, you know, branch he's on, you know, cause they want to stun it and swallow it before, you know, they don't want it to wake up in their belly. Uh, that would be awkward, right? Uh, but they, you know, they, they love those caterpillars, super important for their raising their young too. And we'll get a little bit more into that too. Um, they're also important pollinators. Um, you know, we, again, we think of butterflies as the big powerhouses of pollinators or bees. Um, and they are, bees are super important pollinators as are butterflies. Moths are just as important. Um, there are some flowers too, like uh, uh, evening primrose that is pollinated by moths um, primarily. So there's some specialty flowers out there as well that need moths in order to pollinate. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. I think there's another orchid like that too somewhere. Yeah, fringed orchids, yeah. So important pollinators. They are also a super diverse group of insects, um, which means they are able to pollinate a large variety, a large diversity of plants. Um, and we know diversity is important just for preservation and um, continuation of species and being able to maintain habitats and ecosystems. They also have some really cool, unique adaptions, like um, some of them have uh, sonar jamming, uh, which they use to fight bats, which are a big predator of moths, um, as well as, you know, some of them have like ultrasonic hearing. Um, they're, they're just kind of weird little unique creatures. Yeah, they're unique and beautiful. Forgot about that last line. All right, so when we talk about the food web and how food, how we get energy, all energy comes from the sun, right? It's our big, big, big thing in the sky that dumps radiation on the planet and sunlight. How do we get that? How do we turn that sunlight into food? Well, that happens through plants. The plants are able to absorb that sunlight and turn it into sugars. They're the only thing on this planet able to do that. So how do we get that sugar, that energy from the plants to the rest of us? Well, a lot of us can't eat these plants or they're, they're toxic. Most plants we cannot eat. Most plants mammals can't eat. Most plants, most animals can't eat. But who can eat them? Insects, caterpillars. And that's why caterpillars usually have some type of host plant or maybe a variety of host plants, um, which is why we need a diversity of plants and why native plants are so important because we need those host plants that those caterpillars are, have evolved to feed on in order to extract that energy from the environment because what eats insects? Pretty much everything else. And then everything else eats everything else. So <laughs> when we're looking at the food web, that, that bridge between the energy from the plants to the insects, then to the rest of us, to birds, to mammals, to us, is super important. We need those insects there. And caterpillars are one of those huge crossovers from plants over to the energy for the rest of the food chain. So I kind of touched on the, the host plant thing, right? Um, and why are native plants so important to that? Again, they're the ones we evolved, or the caterpillars or whatever insect that feeds on them evolved to feed on. They're, they're the ones that are used to those toxins that the plants are putting out in order to prevent from being eaten completely. So something like an oak, a native oak, will host 400 plus species. Um, I've seen numbers up to 600 species. And of course that depends on where you are. Um, but something like, uh, I believe that's burning bush down there, might host 15 species, might. There are plenty of things that don't host any species at all, like a ginkgo or uh, English ivy. Detrimental and that they push out the good plants that we want there in order to provide food for those insects that we need. Um, so that's why, there's such stress on um, 
and for birds, other things. Uh, this research was done by, I have to remember her name, Kennedy at Ohio State University. And she um, documented, I forget what she looked at. I think she was looking at photos and like eBird checklists and a bunch of other sources to kind of see what food birds were feeding young, especially, and what they were eating. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but the orange is caterpillars. So most families of birds were feeding, especially their young, caterpillars of uh, butterflies and moths. So there are some other categories, and I'll try to point out a few, but I can't read that. Uh, da, 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 da. So just like chickadees here. This is chickadees. You can see just how much orange that is. Look how much they depend on caterpillars. That's, that's huge. This is vireos, huge number there. Um, woodpeckers, again, large number. Uh, so again, super important food source to birds. Um, and birds aren't the only ones that eat caterpillars. There's a lot of mammals, obviously a lot of reptiles and stuff that eat caterpillars. Um, but birds also provide a lot of food for a lot of other animals. Um, so again, super important food source. All right, now we get into where do we find moths? You can find moths pretty much anywhere, almost at any time of the year. I, see, I can start seeing moths as early as February sometimes, especially if it's warm, like it has been really wacky with the warm ups in the middle of you know, December and January, and then it gets freezing again. It was not great <laughs> because a lot of these moths and butterflies live short life cycles. So if they emerge, um, and they, you know, transform from their catalyst to their adult form, and it's the middle of December, and they maybe got a week before it freezes again, a lot of them aren't going to make it. So that weird timing really isn't great. Um, and it also messes up birds that are migrating through because again, they're waiting for those bud caterpillars to emerge with the leaves when they're starting to leaf out. Well, when you have this kind of whacked out weather, like I feel like this year, the trees are leaving out way early before the birds even really get here. Um, so what is, you know, what does that mean for birds that are trying to migrate through? That might mean that they don't have enough fuel or as much, maybe not as many of them are going to make it to their breeding grounds. Um, same with if there's not enough caterpillar life around um, a breeding uh, habitat for like chickadees per se. If they don't get enough, you know, if they don't have enough food, they're not raising as many chicks. You might get four chicks instead of six, something like that. And with just how much, you know, struggle birds face, you know, every chick is, is really needed because most of them don't make it anyway, even if they make it out of the nest. You know, there's cats, there's predators, there's windows, all types of horrible stuff. Um, I, that's what I was about to get to. I was like, what am I missing here? The light sheets. So, um, Again, you can look for moths pretty much anywhere. One thing that's, you know, porch lights is a, is a good place to look. If you have a porch light, you know, you're probably, you've probably seen moths and a bunch of other stuff hanging out in the light. I don't recommend leaving that on. Um, and I, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but one thing you could do is set up a light sheet. Um, and I've done this like right outside my house. Um, or if you want to get real fancy and go out somewhere with a battery and, you know, lights and a whole setup with the sheet, you can do that. Um, but a light sheet's real nice because it's just a sheet um, or some type of usually a white surface or a light surface and you just shine a light behind it or on it and that will attract um, moths. Usually if you use like a, a blue spectrum or ultraviolet, that's usually the best and you can attract all types of stuff and then you can get nice pictures to help you identify them and stuff like that. Um, I believe the park district of Crystal Lake is planning a light sheet. I believe it's in July. They're planning an event where they're gonna do that. And I think another one in September, I've been talking to them about. Kristen says July 15th, if you wanna mark there it. There you go, calendar. July 15th. You can attract moths and butterflies and all types of stuff to your yard. And no yard is too small. Um, I work with a lot of gardeners who have a lot of different types of yards, um, even people with just balconies and apartment buildings. I have a friend who every year, she only, she lives in an apartment, she has a little balcony, she's allowed to put some plants out there. So every year 
I dig up a couple of my native plants from her yard, pot them from them. She puts them on her balcony. End of the season, I take them back. I replant them in the yard. And, you know, then she doesn't have to store the pots and stuff like that. It's, it's a great little cycle we got going here. But then she's got something, you know, to attract, you know, she's probably not getting a lot of stuff, but she's gotten like Katie did. She's getting butterflies. She's gotten bees, you know, stuff like that. Um, she gets hummingbirds. So, um, you know, no yard is too small. For sure. All right. We'll rush through the planting native, but like I mentioned, natives are really important. Um, if you can plant a tree or a shrub or lots of them. Again, you don't need a lot of space. Um, things don't need to be as spaced out as you think they need to be spaced out. Like my husband's always yelling at me because I'll plant things kind of on top of each other. He's like, shouldn't that tree have more space? And I'm like, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> I'm like, trees grow on top of each other all the time. They figure it out, you know? Um, so, you know, if you, you can plant more than you think you can, trust me. <laughs> um, plant a variety of things if you can. Um, you know, you don't have to plant, you know, a hundred species, but you know, five, six, seven, however, you know, however much room you have, whatever your space dictates, you know, plant, plant a little bit of variety to give a little variety of blooming time, um, a couple different species, families. So if you already have like uh, an aster, maybe you want a sunflower, uh, just so you have different plant families to act as different host plants for those moths and other insects. Remove the invasive stuff. And again, you don't have to do that all at once, but, um, or the non-native stuff even. I, I've slowly removed the non-native stuff from my yard and replaced it with natives. You know, I have a, a, I had a mulberry tree, a non-native mulberry. I girdled it and now I'm growing Virginia creeper up it. Um, so, you know, you can do things like that. I've replanted dead trees and just, you know, I've done all types of crazy stuff, but, um, you know, remove that invasive stuff as you, as you can. If you have a tree that's dying, like an old Chinese crab apple, you know, it's like half dead, get rid of it and put it with a, a you know, a native tree, a native shrub, you know, there's, there's native crab apples, there's service berry, there's all types of stuff, plums. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many times people tell me, you know, oh, I don't have a space for a native plant or my, nothing grows in my yard. Trust me, there is a native plant for every space, for every condition. I guarantee it. No yard is too tough. Lawn counts as a non-native and, and quite frankly, maybe not invasive, but by, by definition, but it's, it's dead space. It's dead space that's unproductive. It's, it's, it's useless space. Um, so the more you reduce it um, and, you know, replace it with natives, um, the better. Every year I, you know, inch out just a little bit, little bit, little bit. And now like my whole front yard, there's no lawn. A lot of the back is no lawn. Um, you don't have to do it all at once. You know, baby steps is always a good idea. Yes, Randy. Lawn is invasive. Looks like it's something to have to do with the biology. It does have infections in the grass. Uh, that's probably true. And probably quack grass too, actually. Quack grass is definitely invasive. <laughs> I stand corrected. Avoid pesticides. I think this goes without saying, if you are trying to attract insects, you do not want to use pesticides. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you have a problem inside your home or something, you know, obviously you might have to, you know, do something, you know, uh, maybe around the parameter of your house or something like that. But even if you have, you know, you know, Japanese beetles all over your yard or something, you know, trying to eradicate them with pesticide probably isn't going to work. And you're probably getting beneficial insects along with it. So it's probably just good to just avoid that. Maybe try some other methods. Um, Mosquito spraying is a huge topic. I get questions on all the time and it's something I fight, you know, against in my village and have worked to reduce in my village uh, for years now. It's been a slow education process, but we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, there's a lot of easy ways to make your own mosquito dunks, uh, mosquito buckets, mosquito traps in your yard, just using a bucket with some hay and a mosquito dunks that you can buy at like Menards and stuff like that. Um, and then I would say, you know, we all live in, most of us live in some type of incorporated village or something that has an HOA or a board of trustees or something like that. 
and one of the things that like as a trustee that I, I need is I need people to come to those meetings and I know they're boring and dumb and whatever, but we need you to come to the meetings and speak your voice. We need to hear from you guys that, Hey, we don't want mosquito spraying anymore. Or, Hey, you know what? We want to plant more natives or, Hey, we want this or that. We need to hear from you. Cause I'll hear it all this time outside of the meetings, you know, like, why are we spraying for mosquitoes? This is a waste of money. It doesn't work. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. Come to the meeting and say that <laughs> I need backup. I need, you know, I need voices because we work for you as trustees, you know, we're going to do what our constituents want us to do. So we need to hear from you guys too, um, from the environmental advocates in our neighborhood. So once in a while, peek your head in that meeting and say, Hey, public comment time, speak your word. All right, so there's been a, a, I don't wanna say a new concept, but Heather Holm, who if you've never heard of her is freaking awesome. Um, <laughs> she does a lot on uh, bees, a lot of native bees and wasps and stuff like that, and native plants. And one of the concepts she kind of named, I guess we'll say is called soft landings. Um, so it might be great that we you know, plant a native oak or we plant a native bush or something like that, but if we put lawn underneath it or, you know, a sea of mulch, we're not helping the caterpillars because a lot of those caterpillars, you know, they they're in the leaves and trees and stuff and they fall to the ground. They overwinter in that leaf litter and stuff like that. They need somewhere to fall. If they're falling on sod lawn that's compacted and just not it's not good for them. Um, same with mulch, you know, especially if you put a layer and layer and layer and layer of mulch. They, you know, some of them need to get underground. Some of them need to get, you know, down into that litter. Well, now you took it away from them. They ain't going to make it. So it does no good just to plant that tree. You need to have the, the whole sort of base underneath them. That's why you plant native plants underneath your trees, underneath your shrubs. Your trees will be much happier too. They don't like sod, most of them. They don't want it. They don't want compacted soil. They don't want you mowing over their roots all the freaking time. And they don't like mulch. We need to get away from the mulch gardens, okay? Yeah. I'm a, I'm, I am a militant against mulch gardens. I get so sad when I see this poor little plant and it's in an ocean of mulch and all its plant friends are like way over here and stuff. Plants don't want that. They want to be with their buddies. <laughs> so allow those plants to fill in that space. <laughs> you know, and, and, and leave your, another common, you know, I don't want to say, wives tale but it's it's kind of a wives tale leave your leaves and leave your leaves and leave your plant litter leave as much of it as you can leave it all you don't touch it I, 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 every every spring like right now i'm on facebook oh wait wait, wait till there's seven consecutive days of 50 degrees but nonsense it's nonsense there are tons of moths tons of insects that overwinter well well past that time they don't emerge till fall so guess what you went in and cleaned up your whole garden. You cleaned all that stuff up, burned it or whatever. You just burned all of them too. So again, just leave it. Most of that stuff is going to be gone by the time you hit midsummer. Most of that stuff's going to break down. It's going to get eaten. It's going to turn into soil. That's 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 just you know the the, the forest isn't cleaning up its own leaf litter. You know what I mean? Um, it leaves it, and that's what becomes back your nutrients in the soil. It's how it recycles itself. If you need to remove some of it. You know, if you need to, you know, get rid of some of it, you can do that because, you know, we have neighbors, we have rules, uh, you know, <laughs> leave as much as you can get away with, though. Or, you know, what I have to do sometimes is move some of it to another space where I just let it sit, you know, in the back corner out of, you know, the public eye, so to speak. Um, but if you can and where you can, just leave it, just leave it alone. You don't need to do anything. Trust me, those woodland plants, they don't care. They're coming right up through that stuff. All right, so this has been a hot topic as of late, and it's, it's kind of nice that, um, you know, people are becoming more aware of, hey, we have a lot of light pollution. It's causing a lot of problems, not just for insects, but humans too, uh, humans, birds, a lot of stuff. Um, we're really not meant to be up and awake and exposed to light past sunset. Um, that's just the natural rhythm of things. So 
with all this light pollution we have on, I mean, it's, it's definitely not good for moths. Um, a lot of them will waste, you know, their lives buzzing around a light, screws them up. Um, they're not out reproducing. A lot of them, the adult forms, they, they live very short lives. They have a very small time to order to reproduce. Um, so we don't want to waste their lives buzzing around a light where they're not doing anything because they're attracted to the light. If you do need an outside light, because um, obviously I know some people are concerned about security, you know, depending on where you live and stuff like that, I suggest get a, a censored light um, that will turn on if, you know, someone comes up or you need a light when you're walking up to your porch or something, have an automatic light and use a yellow filter um, bulb. Don't use a blue light, don't use those white lights, you know, or cool light bulbs. Those are the bad ones. We want the warm light, we want the yellow light. Yes, it's not as bright, um, but it's far less effective on, it has far less of an effect on the insects um, and on people too. And then don't use those stupid bug zappers. Those are, those are useless. We have one at my family cottage and I'm, <laughs> I'm constantly fighting with my dad. Like he'll plug it in and then I'll go unplug it and then he'll plug it in and I'll unplug it. We just, we have this battle all summer where we're doing that. You know, and they're like, oh, it's working because they hear it. Bzz, 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 bzz. It's not mosquitoes. There are moths flying around. There's mayflies. There's Donson flies. There's all types of bird food and other insects that are just getting because they're attracted to that light. And again, you're, you're not putting any dents in the mosquito population. All right. So when you do get down to taking some pictures and trying to ID, and I do recommend trying to get a picture. You can get pretty good pictures with your phone. I mean, I've gotten, you know, a lot of good pictures just, you know, uh, you know, running around trying to get a picture. Um, but uh, there are a few books out here. There was just a, you had the nice Caterpillar book. That was a nice one. Um, and then there's the Peterson Guide is what I usually use um, for the moths. Again, it's, it's, it's tedious. Um, because there's so many to look through. And again, there's no clear like, oh, this is going to be in this family. Yeah, you go there and you're like, nope, nope, nope. Um, there are a lot of great websites to help and uh, like Facebook groups, stuff like that. Um, I use butterfliesandmoss.org for all my submissions. Um, it's a, a database and uh, they take submissions from all over North America and down into Central America. Um, so I put all my stuff on there and they have an expert come in and ID it. It might take a little time, um, but, but they, they, they do a good job. Um, Bugguide.net is a really good one too for general insect identification of all types. Um, and iNaturalist is another good one as well. Um, and again, there's some Facebook groups out there, some resources. But again, moths are you know, kind of the stepchild of insects sometimes. So there's, it's hard to find good data on them. Oh. And that's all I have. <laughs> yeah. Are there some questions? Yes. Any questions? So four questions. Four. You get four. That's it. Four. Here we go. None. Okay. Oh, I know there's some. Sure. So, so what it is is basically, um, you can get them at Menards or Ace or you know wherever, and. Um, I don't know where they would be in the store, probably where all the like roach killer and stuff is, but the yeah, the pesticides and stuff. And they're just these, they're like these little bars or little round compacted granular. I don't know what it is. It's yeah. They're like a pack of six or whatever. They, they, they have different lengths that they last. It just depends on what kind you get. And you put that in a bucket with water and then you put some hay on top and that will attract the mosquitoes to go in there, lay their eggs and all that, and the, the larva side in the dunk will kill them. So you, so you track them to it and then, yes. But you also just add, if you have, um, so for example, for me, my downspout goes into an area where there's a little bit of standing water mm -hmm. and it goes down. Um, you know, we were seeing you as well together. And there's a little bit of water there. So I drop my dunks Mm -hmm. So that that polluted water never harbors right. mosquito larvae. Yeah. Or you can. So if you have anywhere where there's standing water, you can go stuff. Yeah. Are most of those biophotogenesis? Yeah. Pardon? Are they biophotogenesis? Yeah. Are they biophotogenesis? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a natural. Yes. It's natural, except remember that it kills all lepidoptera. Yeah. Yeah. It will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will kill like flies and stuff. Yeah, you can look that up too. Though there's a lot of different ways to do it. Yes. So that would tie into now the movement right now. It's going to be a response moth. Mm-hmm. In terms of how do we take care of hot spots? Of spongy moths, yeah. BT was mentioned, and I understand it's organic, but it you're talking about if you say 450. Uh, moths or caterpillars mm -hmm. are um, uh, oaks support 450 right. different yeah. types. Mm -hmm. Plus, so mm -hmm. even if it's organic, so could you speak to how yes. about that issue? Spongy moths versus other moths, yeah. I mean, the, it's kind of like the same problem with mosquitoes. There's no specifically targeted thing for just mosquitoes because anything that targets mosquitoes is also going to target you know certain midges um certain oh, things like that. mayflies and stuff like that so anything that spongy moth it's going to affect any lepidoptera um so it, it's one of those things where you know how do you pick your battles you know you're going to have some collateral damage so to speak in the fight against the invasive one Right. Yeah. Doing a mass spray. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting better at targeting stuff. And I think you could say the same for plants too. We're, we're getting better at, you know, sort of targeting herbicides on specific plants, but it's not, it's not perfect, you know, and unfortunately invasives are, are just a constant problem. Yes, Randy. Just a quick comment. There is a product called, it used to be called Chip Check. I don't know if they changed the name on that. Maybe. <laughs> it, it's a virus. Okay. We'll get after uh, spongy moths. It's more expensive, so a lot of like municipalities and that don't want to you know, mm -hmm. broadcast anymore. But if you if you're worried in your yard, that's something you can use. Yeah. And you can also wrap trees with burlap, let it fold over, and the, the moths, caterpillars will collect in there, and then you go around and collect them. And over time, there is a, a fungus that spongy moths will get. It will self limit because fungus will start to knock your hot things. But that doesn't help if you got a big outbreak. Mm -hmm. So you might have to run around and scrape those egg masses off. Yep. When it came through, what was that, 10, 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. I was doing that in our yard. Yeah. Yeah. We educated some spongy moths. I have so, so the spongy moth used to be called the gypsy moth. Uh, okay. So I'm sure you all have heard of the gypsy moth and the destruction. <laughs> so that the, the uh, yeah, so the the the, the term gypsy it has been considered a a slur. Yes. So that's why it's been now changed to the spongy moth, which I don't really like that name, but you know. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> One last thing too about controlling of uh, spongy moths. When uh, our area, we live in the right at the edge of. Uh, um, Park Ridge Trails and Department of Ag came in years ago and, and monitored our area for spongy moths. And they found at our house, we didn't have very many spongy moths on our oaks. We have a lot of oaks in our yard, but they had a lot of them. It wasn't a huge amount, but most of the spongy moths on our property were under our deck and under our front porch. Mm. So spraying those areas, yeah. Yeah, useless, yeah. Mm -hmm. useless. Yeah. So instead, go around if you want to attack the spongy moths on your property, go around and look under things like that, scrape them off yourself, drop them into soapy yeah. water, I guess is the best yeah. thing. Don't, uh -huh. don't get out your spray bottle. You're going to be sprayed. Spraying and killing all those yep. that uh, you don't want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's always that challenge with invasives and yeah, like fish. I know we have a big problem with the Asian carp in the Illinois River. It's like, how do you get that one and not kill everything else? You know, and that's why they'll have those catches where you know they have the boats running down the river and they're you know with their nets sticking out and they're jumping all over the place. Yeah, it's just. Or the zebra mussels, you know, that have invaded Lake Michigan. Yes. Oh, good. So 
What's his thing about making mosquitoes train illegal? Can you repeat the question for the people at home? What do you think about making mosquitoes train illegal? So the question is, uh, <laughs> what do we think about making mosquito spraying illegal? I don't think it will ever happen. Um, just because when there is outbreak of disease, there you're you're gonna have like what I always tell my residents is you know our mosquito program in our village is 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 meant to curb disease. So it's supposed to be a two tier approach of larvicide and spraying. So you're trying to knock down the adults when they emerge, which is very tricky to do to predict when they emerge because there's several different types of mosquitoes and they have different times of emerging. Um, so, or they nest in different types of habitats or they, you know, some of them are more daytime flyers, some fly a little higher than, I mean, they're, they're just all different. Um, but in turn, like when Zika uh, showed up in Florida, I mean, they did mass sprains over, you know, large wild areas to try to knock down that adult population. Um, yes, and they've, they've, they've been doing that too, which is a little scary. Um, but, you know, so I, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think our area needs to worry, at least not yet, um, too much about some of those diseases. But some of those mosquitoes are coming north. Some of those diseases are coming north. Um, so when there's a big outbreak of something like West Nile or Zika or, you know, whatever, malaria, what, I don't know if malaria is coming back anytime soon, but you never know. Who knows? Maybe it'll, it'll you know, morph into some other horrible thing. But um, when you have those big outbreaks, they're going to do some massive spraying to try to combat that. And, um, you know, for a long time, I actually just found out, I thought a lot of mosquitoes were actually native. Most of them are not to the United States. Most of them were brought over um, on ships and stuff like that. So it is actually an invasive non-native species, most of them. Um, there are some native ones as well, uh, but a lot of them are south. Um, so, but yes. Oh, sure. <clears throat> yep. So the, so we have a quick little plug. The WPPC is having their native plant sale um, at MCC on Saturday, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday sorry, Sunday. Um, yeah, there's flyers going around. You can look it up on the website. I think they start at noon, but they're allowing people to, yeah, yeah. They're allowing people to line up at 11, so. Um, but were there any other questions? Sure, and then we'll get the guy in the back. Well, moths are, well, moths are attracted to light. So are most animals. So like birds, why we have so many birds crashing into windows and stuff like that at night is they're attracted to the light. It confuses them. It, 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 it you know, even, even humans, humans are attracted to light. If you're in a dark, dark space, you're going to go seek out the light. You know what I mean? Um, it's just something that apparently most living creatures do. Um, so doing things, you know, flying around that light, getting confused, um, so. Yep. It's, 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 it's neither. It's, a. Uh, it, oh, um, as a true fly or true bug or something yeah it's not a moth or a butterfly though it is very flashy and pretty as far as i know there haven't been any in our area yet i'm sure it's coming yeah yeah so um but but that's all the questions we have so i'm gonna pass this back that's right. <laughs> oh thank you Lisa. yeah put your chair where you are